Good morning, church. Welcome to Max Sunday morning service. Uh, we're so happy that you're able to join us. If you're here for the first time, a special welcome to you. We would love to know that you're here. So if you could just go to our website, machurch.ca, click on the I'm New card. And by filling out that card, uh, we will connect with you. And we will also say thank you by pledging a donation to a local charity on your behalf. Well, next Sunday is Mother's Day, and as a church, we want to say thank you to our moms. So, and we need you to participate. We need you to help us out with that. So if you wouldn't mind, um, just record a short video clip, you know, 10 to 30 seconds, finishing the statement, thank you, mom, for, and we will put those together uh, to honor our moms next Sunday. It would be great if you could send them to office at machurch.ca. We're really hoping they'll come in today, Sunday, but if not, as soon as you can send those in, we would greatly appreciate it. I want to give you a little bit of an update on MAC Life Groups. There are quite a few going on through the week, so don't forget to check out the Life Groups page on our website. I wanted to highlight that Thursday morning Bible study with Felicia is starting up again, uh, starting up online this Thursday at 10, uh, starting May the 7th. So if you're interested in joining uh, that study where you'll be studying building your faith, you can register uh, on the website. If you have any questions about uh, registration, what it is like to join a Zoom call, um, please contact us and we will be able to help you with that process. The next announcement is for you uh, kids, Mac kids. We have uh, the opportunity for you to ask Pastor Chris whatever you would like. And he will be answering your questions over the next few Sundays, or some of your questions. So if you wouldn't mind uh, asking your mom or dad to help you, send an email with your question to office at machurch.ca, and then we'll see, um, we'll see what his answers are in the next few Sundays. I'd like to remind you that today, Sunday, we are having our second MAC meetup at 11 o'clock. Uh, it's a time of connection after the service. It sort of replicates what would happen uh, naturally after a Sunday morning service. So that meeting is happening on Zoom, and you can find the link on our Facebook page, or you can also find it on our website. And uh, no pressure, whether you're here for the first time or you're just wanting to reconnect with some folks, you're welcome to join us. Uh, on that note, if you know of someone who has not been able to catch the services online or hasn't been able to engage or stay connected online, would you please contact us here at the church? We have some options for uh, folks who, um, you know, to get the service in other ways. So just contact us, you know, send an email to the office or contact us through the website, and then we'll be able to reach out, out to help those folks. Uh, lastly, at Mac, you know, we encourage First Fruits Giving, and if you would like to give, you can in uh, several different ways. Uh, the first is by using Tithely, and you can get to that app uh, directly through our website by clicking Give, and you are able to use your debit or credit card uh, with the Tithely app. You can also send an e-transfer to office at machurch.ca, or lastly, you can uh, mail your envelopes or drop them off at the front of the church. Let's worship together.
praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, and this is my song, praising my Savior. Good morning, everyone. My name is Simone Latham, and the Bible verse that I want to share with you today is from Proverbs 1, 33. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. So what have I been doing during the pandemic? Well, I've um, painted the interior of my house. I've been sewing, knitting, baking, cleaning, doing a lot of solitary walking. I've learned how to use Zoom and um, a lot of texting and kind of being connected with people that, that are having a hard time. So uh, I wish you all well, uh, blessings on your Sunday and look forward to seeing everybody very, very soon. Okay, kids, thanks to Faithville Media, we have a program just for you. So at this time, if you can just find uh, a quiet spot, another place, um, and another screen, you can enjoy a program just for you. Well, hey, folks, great to connect with you once again today. Hope you are enjoying the uh, nice weather we're starting to get. It's a beautiful uh, relief, really, after this uh, time we've been in. We can get out a little bit more and uh, keep our distance, of course, but uh, enjoy the nice weather. So thank the Lord for that. As you know, I've been inviting you to join me in the pilgrimage of the bald. And uh, we have a couple of disciples who've uh, got on board. And I want to show you, uh, first of all, we have Josh from Penetang and uh, looking super hip there with the brick background. Very nice. Glad to have you on board, Josh. And then we have Dave from Victoria Harbor who uh, already was hip as a professional marathon runner, but now twice as cool with the new haircut. So looking real good. So thanks, Josh and Dave. And again, if any anybody else wants to uh, get in on uh, the party, just uh, send me a picture and we'll uh, put it up on a Sunday. So we're continuing our series we've been doing called Prayer Time. We're looking at the Lord's Prayer, breaking it down, understanding the different components we're praying and why we are praying them. Last week, we looked at Dad. And uh, the first point in that message was God is our good Father. Jesus invites us to pray to God as Father, invoking Him in the most personal of terms. God is our loving Heavenly Father, and we pray to Him as such. Although God is neither male nor female, God is a spirit, he is nevertheless revealed in Scripture as Father. This is His divine nature. God the Father relates to Jesus the Son. Jesus the Son relates to the Holy Spirit. So we ask the question, have I received the Father's unconditional love for me? Second point, heaven is our eternal home. Scripture tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and also that we are citizens of heaven. Although all the time we've ever known has been spent here on earth, this is just something that we are ultimately passing through en route to something that will last forever. When we die as believers, we immediately go to be with the Lord in heaven. We don't know how long we're going to have on this place we call earth, but we don't despair because it's not our final home. Heaven is our home. So when we pray, our Father who art in heaven, we're reminding ourselves of that incredible truth. So we ask the question, am I looking forward to heaven? Because we should be. And finally, the Father is close to us. He's not far away. He's not removed from the struggles and pains of this life, but rather he is close, as close as the mention 
of his name. Thank you, Father, for drawing near to me. So, are you familiar with this object? Any guesses? Yes, I'm sure any young person watching already would have said, Mjolnir, the hammer of Thor. And there's an a inscription about this hammer. It's from the uh, Avengers movies, of course. And it says, Whosoever holds the hammer, if he be worthy, shall possess the power of Thor, the Norse god of thunder. So it means that either you're worthy of the hammer of Mjolnir or you're not. Uh, there's no partial worthiness of wielding Mjolnir the hammer, right? You can't be sort of 50% worthy. You're either worthy or you're not. And uh, thankfully, my favorite character, Captain America, turns out he was worthy. Like, nobody gets to hold this hammer except Thor, typically. But Captain, finally, in the last movie, Endgame, because he is worthy, uh, gets to wield this hammer and use it in the big battle against Thanos. So, Mjolnir needs a level of worthiness, you know, needs you to be worthy to hold it. And this idea of worthiness is something we want to talk about today. How does worthiness or worshipfulness fit into the Lord's prayer? Let's take a look at that. So we'll go back to Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. This then is how you should pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now the word hallowed is from the Greek hagiazo, which means to separate, consecrate, cleanse, purify, sanctify, regard or reverence as holy. So because God is God, he doesn't need to become holy. He's already perfect. The prayer is that he would be regarded as such and that we would be mindful that God is hagios, that is, he is holy, he is high and lifted up, he is worthy. And this is our first point today, that before anything else, God is holy. It's the beginning of the Lord's Prayer for a reason. Yes, God is love, but in equal measure, God is holy. Worship at its core recognizes the holiness of God, the otherness of God. He is the only uncreated one, the only one without beginning or end, the only self-sustaining one. God doesn't need anything or anyone else, full stop. He is holy. I love that uh, passage from Isaiah chapter 6 where the prophet Isaiah has a vision of the throne room of God in heaven and he talks about how he saw angels um, surrounding the throne with these enormous sets of, of wings and they're crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty over and over and over again. And it's such an overwhelming scene that the prophet Isaiah is overcome with a sense of his own sinfulness. And he says, woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips. It's no mistake that the first part of the Lord's Prayer, after approaching God as our Father, as we talked about last week, is worship. Every time we pray, hallowed be thy name, we give God the glory that he's due, and we remind ourselves he is holy. So I want to look at Leviticus chapter 10, and just to set the stage for this, the context is Israel has come out of slavery in Egypt, and Moses has received the law of Israel. God, the ten, the ten Commandments, the Mosaic Law, the tabernacle has been set up according to God's directions, and now the Israelites are receiving instructions for offerings and sacrifices that are going to happen in this tabernacle 
uh, structure and what that's going to look like. So this is all sort of new for them. So let's pick it up, Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. Now, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. So Nadab and Abihu were the first two sons of Aaron, who was designated as the high priest uh, for the Israelites. God had marked their family specifically for the special priestly duties of Israel in this new you know, uh, this new structure of the tabernacle. But it wasn't long at all before they screwed it up, big time. The text says they offered strange fire. Now, the author doesn't exactly spell out what strange fire means, but one thing was certain. Aaron's sons had violated the commands that God had given for worship. Along with their father, they had just participated in the inaugural sacrifices of the new tabernacle, so they should have known better, really. And then fire comes out from God, and we might look at this as too harsh of a punishment as they are killed, really, for doing this strange fire offering. But we have to remember that this was a pivotal time in the unfolding of God's plan of redemption on earth. The tabernacle and temple worship system, the giving and establishing of the law for God's people and all that that meant and, and the great importance of that. And so this was a key event in God communicating, you know, uh, that this was a big deal. And even as we look at a key episode in the New Testament, a key judgment is the death of Ananias and Sapphira, a couple who sold property they had, and then they came to the apostles and said, here's the proceeds from the sale. But they lied. They said, this is, this is the totality of the, the amount of money that we received for the sale of the land, when really it was only a portion. And then you know, God revealed to the apostles, hey, these guys are lying. They called them out on it, and then they died right then and there. A a huge judgment, but it was a key season as well in God's plan of redemption. That was the birth and growth of the church as the church was in its uh, days of uh, infancy, its earliest days. And then after that, there was, of course, this great Uh, fear of God that came over his people, and the church grew. So these judgments happen in key seasons at key times. But verse 3 of the text captures an even more important reason. Let's take a look at that, verse 3. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord meant when he said, I will display my holiness through those who come near me. I will display my glory before all the people And Aaron was silent. I will be proved holy. God was showing his people, you can't just worship me in whatever way is convenient for you with an attitude of entitlement and self-centeredness. That's not going to fly. You have to approach me with humility, with sober-mindedness, because I am God. So, Here's the point. God is to be taken seriously. God is to be taken seriously. Jesus railed against a lackadaisical approach to God and worship. He said the Father was looking for those who would worship him with their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Looking for those who would worship him in spirit and in truth. Being a one-foot-in and one-foot-out Christian or Uh, you know, a biblical word or phrase that people have used over the years is a lukewarm Christian. That doesn't work well for God because he commands us to be all in. Can you say it with me? All in. There you go. And we should be all in. Why? Because 
God is holy. It doesn't mean becoming a weird person, right, that can't relate to anybody or someone who's super judgmental of other people or becomes spiritually proud because you think you're further along than the next guy or the next gal. No, that's not what it means to be all in. Rather, it means just taking your faith seriously, which really means taking God seriously. And this is something that young people need to be challenged. And if you're a young person watching, I really want to challenge you this way as well, to own your own faith. It's not enough just to sort of hang on the coattails of mom or dad or, you know, a friend or whoever it might be. You need to own your own faith. And I'm so thankful that we had a number of our high schoolers participate in the Deeper Life Summit this past Friday, which, you know, they did a Zoom uh, online meeting, of course. This was a district initiative for our high school youth. And that's a great step. And I already heard some great uh, things, positive reviews about how that went as far as a faith-building uh, thing to do together for high schoolers. So I just uh, encourage you, young people, in that journey. And remember the words of, of Paul to Timothy even though you're young, set an example for the believers by your faith, by your conduct. So take your faith seriously. Take that next step. Let's continue in our text. First Peter, you are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. So you are God's temple, Peter says. A new spiritual temple. Originally, you had the tabernacle that we looked at earlier, and then later on, of course, you had the uh, temple, the more you know, solid structure in Jerusalem. But these were just temporary foreshadowings of God's ultimate temple. And God's ultimate temple is not made with fabric or blocks or bricks and mortar, but rather it's made with people. It's made with you and I. And it is, of course, the church. The cornerstone of God's temple, the church, is Jesus Christ, the mediator between God and man. But then he says, the other stones, and they're living stones, Peter says, are all of us, you and I, brothers and sisters in this uh, family of God that we call the church. And who is the builder? God is the builder. We just submit to the process and allow the builder to use us. So I've been able to start an outdoor project during this time, and it is a shed building project because I saw that the previous owner, we moved into our place a little over a year ago in Penetang, and the previous owner I saw must have had a shed there because there were some patio slabs in the back corner of the property. So I said, let me uh, get a bigger shed than whatever this one was. But to do that, I'm going to need to expand the base. And what happened was you can see that um, I needed to, you know, sort of have the base go more to the right, but it slopes down. So I needed to build a retaining wall. So I decided to use some of the uh, timbers that were uh, on the property and start to put these down into the ground. And then one thing led to another. I found out I need rebar, and I need a proper hammer to hammer it into the ground because you have to make it nice and solid uh, because this retaining wall is going to hold up all of this dirt. And you can see I've started to fill it in here and ultimately hold up the the, uh, limestone screenings that you see here and ultimately hold up the patio stones and ultimately hold up the shed. So everything is kind of riding on these timbers that I'm using for this uh, retaining wall here. 
And it's just, I thought, a really neat example of these. I know they're, they're not stones, like what Peter's talking about in his text here. But the point is, they're being used by me, the builder, to really hold up the whole structure. And, of course, the cornerstone, you know, the most important piece is uh, Jesus. But then he uses all of us in that process as well. If we go back to the text here, uh, verse 5, it says, You are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are holy priests. You are holy priests. You, everyone who comes to faith through Jesus Christ, you are his priests. You are the new family of Aaron. Remember, Aaron and his family were chosen by God to be the priests for the people of Israel. Well, Peter says, now you are the priests. You are the new Levites, if you will. And you might say, well, Pastor Chris, I'm not qualified to be a priest. You know, I didn't go to Bible college, or I don't have a theology degree, or I don't know enough, or whatever the case might be. Well, none of us are really qualified in and of ourselves to be a priest according to the biblical standard except through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So here's the point. In Christ, God makes us holy. And it's present tense on purpose. God made us holy. He makes us holy, is making us holy, and will make us holy. So we've been made holy officially Past tense, that's justification. We're becoming holy practically. Present tense, that's sanctification. And we will be holy. Future tense, that is ultimately holy. Glorification in the resurrection. So you might say, well, I don't feel very holy. And that would be true of all of us, of course, especially after we give in to temptation in a moment of, weakness, but we have to be careful not to place our identity in our mistakes or in our weakness. Um, You might know that I get to do a monthly chapel service normally over at Waypoint uh, Mental Health Center working with the folks in the atrium side, which is the maximum security side. So a lot of these uh, folks in there have been there a long time and will be there, some for the duration of their lives. And some have done heinous crimes, um, you know, terrible things. But they come to chapel. A number of them come to chapel, and I get to work with these patients and minister to them and direct them, encourage them in their faith walk with the Lord, and I believe that there is genuine faith and growth that has happened and is happening. So even though they may have done something terrible in the past, that doesn't necessarily mean that that is who they are forever, that that is their identity. No, it's not, because that's not how God works. That's not how faith works. Should we be held responsible for our actions? Yes, absolutely. Should our decisions have consequences? Definitely. Otherwise, How will we learn anything? How will we ever take responsibility? But the big picture for Christians is that because of the mediation of Jesus, as Peter says, God has made us holy. And this is why, as he said in the text, we can offer spiritual sacrifices, whether it's the sacrifice of, you know, praying, you know, whether it's uh, singing songs of worship, to God, whether it's studying the scriptures, whether it's giving, learning to give the first fruits of your income to God, whether it's helping other people, whether it's just doing good. We offer these spiritual sacrifices as priests, really, of God in his house. And it's just been great to see how you have stepped up in different ways during this time to offer some of those sacrifices to help uh, people, especially during this challenging time of COVID-19. It was a couple that said, hey, we'd like to do this uh, coffee machine 
donation for the hospital and can we get the church involved and and we did that and then and then another couple we we heard about doing a neighborhood initiative to raise some money and buy pizzas for different frontline teams at the hospital and at waypoint and so forth and then all kinds of all kinds of you many different folks have been sewing masks making masks to help just anyone who might need one it's just been great to see how you have stepped up to offer those sacrifices, really offer those blessings to other people in the name of Jesus during this time. And uh, makes me proud as a pastor, absolutely. So just in recapping here today, the first point is, before anything else, God is holy. Before anything else, God is holy. Do I recognize the holiness of God first? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your name is holy. You are worthy. Such a key principle for us to meditate on and get. Secondly, God is to be taken seriously. Where do I need to submit to God's leadership? Where do I need to, you know, take this a little bit more seriously? Whether it's reading the scriptures and praying more regularly or in a relationship I might be in. Uh, or am entertaining? Do I need to uh, look at that again? Or with finances, you know, where I might be spending money or, or making decisions related to finances or, or giving, and where do, how do I need to look at that related to God's leadership? Or choices in any particular area of life. I need to take God and his leadership seriously. And finally, in Christ, God makes us holy. In Christ, God makes us holy. He makes us his priests in his house, in his church. Thank you, God, for making me a priest in your house. It's not because, you know, we're anything super special in and of ourselves. It's because of what Jesus Christ, the great mediator, has done for you and I. So we just give thanks for that. Let's close by praying together. Father, we thank you for the chance to uh, connect once again. And we give you praise, Lord, because you are the hallowed one. You are the holy one. You are worthy. We uh, stand with those angels, as it were, around your throne, crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty. God, first and foremost, you are worthy of our praise and worship just because of who you are. And so, God, we recognize your holiness in this moment. And, Lord, we want to be those who do take you seriously. We don't want to be flippant or lackadaisical. God, we don't want to be kind of half in, half out. Help us to be those who love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Bless my brother, or sister listening, watching today, uh, with the courage to go all in, all in with you. God, whatever next step we need to take, God, in our faith journey, help us to do that, I pray. And Lord, we thank you that you have made us holy. God, we know in and of ourselves we can never be good enough, holy enough. But God, because of Jesus Christ, because of his sacrifice for us on the cross and glorious resurrection. You have made us priests, really, in your house, your temple, the church, which you are building, and you're using us, God, in the building of the church, in the forward movement of the church, using us as extensions of your hands and feet. Lord, and we pray, God, you'll continue to have your way in and through us, in and through this time, to be extensions of uh, your grace and your truth to folks around us. We continue to pray for everyone who's working in a frontline capacity. We pray for protection. We pray for the grace for them to continue to do their job with excellence. And Lord, that, that things will continue to move in a positive direction. God, we thank you for working everything together for good. And we give you praise because you are worthy. Pray these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Amen.
worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. Thank you for joining us for our service today. Just a reminder that our MAC meetup is happening right after 
the service basically starting at 11, and you can get connected uh, via Zoom. The information is right here. So uh, please do that. would love to see you for that. Just want to pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you, and give you peace. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer as we close. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God bless you folks so much. Have a great day.